So welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight at the third art talk of the spring semester art talk series hosted by the Department of Fine Arts at the Zurich University of the Arts. It's uh, my big pleasure and huge honor to welcome tonight uh, Susan Phillips, who will give the third art talk in this season. Uh, of course, I would also like to thank um, the people who um, enable us to uh, have great artists as uh, visiting faculty like Susan Phillips. So thank you, Billy Davis, Svetlana Heger, and Rafael Gigax for also co-organizing this series. I'm uh, giving a warm welcome to, to Annika Ström, who I see among the audience again, uh, and also uh, <laughs> giving a quick preview of uh, what awaits us on 19th of May in the series. She will have her art talk on 19th of May, so please make sure to join us again. But for today, um, let me briefly introduce myself before I come to Susan Phillips' uh, short CV. I'm Gabrielle Schad, uh, your host and moderator. I'm a research associate in the Department of Fine Arts and uh, will figure as your <laughs> mediator also uh, to put out your questions that you please um, type in the chat and uh, engage also if you dare. Um, with your voice in a in an oral co uh, conversation, both is possible, whatever feels right for you. Uh, we will start out with a around 45 minutes talk given by Susan, and then have about 15 minutes for a Q&A and discussion. Um, I also wanted to point out that uh, this uh, meeting will be recorded and for, uh, forwarded to interested parties upon request. So if you do not want to be recognized on the recording, uh, please uh, turn off your camera or change your name. Or, yeah, just go under the radar. Um, that said, let's turn to Susan Phillips. Uh, the more uh, well-known an artist is, the shorter the short CV they <laughs> provide usually <laughs> is as well. And so it's a very brief outlook. Uh, Susan Phillips is born in 1965 in uh, Scotland and uh, she has exhibited in many, many solo <laughs> and group exhibitions worldwide. She famously won the Turner Prize in 2010 and currently lives and works in Berlin. Maybe um, one of the, sh of the shows or um, installations many recall is uh, the 2012 contribution to the Documenta in Kassel. Uh, we may have time to come back to that uh, in the Q&A. Uh, and also, of course, her uh, show at the Kunsthaus Bregenz in 2016. That is not so far back ago. So maybe even some of you have been there and seen the show. Um, her work deals with the spatial properties of sound and with the relationships between sound and architecture. She is particularly interested in emotive and psychological properties of sound and how it can be used as a device to alter individual consciousness. She has used sound as a medium in public space to trigger an awareness in the listener to temporarily alter their perception of themselves in a particular place and time. And now I'm really happy to leave the floor to you, Susan. Uh, thank you for uh, giving us this insight with your art talk today. Thank you, Gabrielle. It's really nice to be here or with you again in Switzerland, albeit um, virtually. I mean, the last time I traveled was to Switzerland for the uh, talk at the Bialer, but in the end, they could have, they have, there wasn't much of an audience because it was just getting quite hard with lockdown and everything and so it was kind of strange but it was but that was really the last time I traveled when I was coming to to Switzerland um 
So it was nice that you 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 read out my um, artist statement because that is something that I wrote when I was in Belfast, but back and it's one of the first works that I wanted to talk to you about. And that's that statement, you know, it still rings, it stays true today. It's, um, it's, it's, it's still a, a statement that I work with since 1998. <laughs> so it's still really relevant. And all those, all those aspects of, of the spatial values of sound and how it heightens your sense of yourself in a particular place and time, that's something that I always come back to. So, um, yeah, so the work that I wanted to begin with is a work that was originally for, um, it was an intervention into public space. Uh, it was an intervention in, into a, a bus station in Belfast when I was, I just graduated from my master's and I stayed there and I, I um, <clears throat> was involved in an artist run gallery and then I went on to do my own grassy knoll productions. Um, but so one of the, so I was really fascinated by the idea of making interventions into public space. I, and this particular work is when I smuggled my voice into the PA system of the bus station. So intermittently, you heard me sing these melancholy pop songs on, sung in the first person, all on themes of longing, sympathy and release. So no, well known songs, songs that you would you would you might recognize, but when you just sing them stripped back with any musical accompaniment, it sounds quite different, you know, and in a female voice. So I'm still staying as true to the original as I can, you know, if I, I sing a sing air bad bag by Radiohead or Who Loves the Sun. So it's, I chose these songs that you that, that more evoke a sense of solitude and uh, that you might sing if you're alone. And so then when you play it through the PA system intermittently, you're sort of quite surprised. You know, the audience sort of happens upon it unexpectedly. So um, but more recently, I showed that um, at the Byler Foundation as part of the, the show there. And I, I went to do work with their um, transitory space, the lobby, which is where the bookshop is and uh, where the seating area is. So again, I wanted to smuggle my voice into the, through the PA system. And I think they were quite reticent to do that initially, but then when we did the test, we could see that people were really engaged with it and were surprised. So, so, um, so that was every 20 minutes, you heard a different um, song. So I thought we could just start with that uh, video. Thank you. 
Nee, 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 stopp. Ja, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. So I see I'm clearly not a trained singer, but I, I'm going to just sound, make it sound like I was more singing to myself than to an audience or how you might perform um, to an audience. So, and like I say, all, all these songs had similar themes of longing and escape. And so I suppose when you're in a bus station, you're not really aware of your environment. You're sort of just thinking of where you're going or who you're going to meet off the bus or so at that moment you became very aware of your environment and uh, and that's something that I've continued to to do since since then you know working and working in different ways with my I'm known for working with my voice and I, so I started working with single channel um, installations and then I went on to working with multi-channel uh, installations with my voice with the, the Turner Prize was a three channel work under the, the three bridges that got me and um, and then a four channel then it's seven channel and then um, so I I, I, I've, I suppose I've been known to work working with my own voice and in public space but then I, I decided that it would be interesting to also explore working with um, classical music. And for me, that was um, something that, I mean, I mean, I'd been working, you know, in in the way in that way for many years, but I, to, to, I wanted to move in a different direction. So, um, so I wanted to cl explore classical music as a form. And uh, but but I'm not a musician, and I can't even read music. So. <laughs> but that did help um, me approach it in a, in, a, in a different way. And so I could, I could see that classical music uh, is organized around a set of tones and that are, that, that are, there are 12 tones and uh, in the chromatic scale. And that suggested to me that I could sort of take it apart. Um, dismantle the 12 tones into 12 separate channels. So, um, so that's what I did for the work, uh, Study for Strings that you mentioned, uh, for Documenta. Um, and, you know, that was a composition that was um, originally written by this composer Pavel Haas, and it was composed in, uh, when he, while he was interned in Theresienstadt concentration camp. And it was um, performed um, live uh, to, or filmed by the, um, the SS for their propaganda film. And you can see Pavel Haas's orchestra perform uh, Study for Strings. But sadly, it was destroyed and, and he, they, were, they, were, they were killed. And, and so, so what I did with that composition was only record two of the voices and then <clears throat> So there's huge gaps, holes where the, the other voices would be, the other instruments in the orchestra would be. I only chose to work with the cello and the viola. So, so what I did was, so by taking it apart and then reassembling it, it sounded very different. I mean, it had this, like these this absences where the others would be. And also it just sounded really sort of disjointed and kind of like um, broken down in a way. So, so yeah, so that was back in what, 2012 and I continued um, to work with, with classical music and, um, and became, uh, and during my research for Documenta, I became really interested in the emigres who, had to flee Germany in the 30s. And, um, and so part of file score is the, um, the next work that I would like to show you because it's a work that um, illustrates that most clearly in a way. Um, uh, as I wasn't able to use the art, I was able to use the architecture um, of the space to arrange the installation, which was wonderful. I mean, the, I was invited by <clears throat> Hamburger Bahnhof to show, uh, to make a work, a new work for their incredible historic hall. And, you know, part, so um, 
I really was inspired by the fact that I had formerly been a train station. And, uh, and so I, I was also struck by its, this imposing architecture. I mean, it has like um, these 12 steel archways and the, the 12 steel archways got me thinking about I mean, the 12 tone composers who had to, um, to flee uh, and many went to, to Hollywood. And there was one in particular that I, I became really interested in and that was, <coughs> excuse me, Hans Eisler. Hans Eisler was um, a composer who was a prod prodigy of um, Arnold Schoenberg. Um, and he also used the 12 tone technique and, and so, I mean, he, it's, his story is particularly tragic because not only did he have to flee Germany from uh, Nazi Germany, but when he got to the US, he was hounded by the FBI. They were convinced that he was a, a communist who was set on infiltrating the Hollywood Dream Factory. And so they followed his every move and they... In fact, he was one of the he was the very first artist to brought up to be, to be brought up in front of the House of Un-American Activities. You know, when the when they ask, oh, "Have you or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party?" He was he was the first, you know, uh, artist. And so, uh, so during that time, I mean, he composed some wonderful um, things for for Hollywood. Um, but also his, some of his best works. And I chose three compositions by him, film scores. And, um, and sort of, it sort of follows his, it's chronological, it follows his sort of um, journey while he was in, in um, Los Angeles. And, um, and so the work that I wanted to show you is a composition um, that he wrote for Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin knew that the FBI were persecuting him, you know, so he wanted to commission um, Eisler to help him, you know. And so he started to write the septet, which, um, which then became uh, in his film, The Circus, its last silent movie before he went to work um, with sound. Um, but it sadly he didn't finish it because by that, by that time, before he could finish it, he was, he, was, he, he was forced to leave. And so he was heartbroken. And, uh, and so <clears throat> I, I was, so what I did was, yeah, I, I recorded this, this 12 tone composition by Hans Eisler. And in this particular film score, I chose to only work with the violin because the violin has a particular, it's quite melancholy. And um, so I thought I would just play that section um, of the part file score at the Hamburger Van Hoff.
so Hamburger Bahnhof was formerly a train station. And that was something that I found really interesting. And as you can see, the 12 steel archways were, I mean, the speakers just disappeared into the architecture. So I really wanted to bring the architecture to the fore. And, you know, train stations are places of departure and separation. And those became themes in the exhibition because, you know, not only did I record each of the individual tones, I, <clears throat> I, I, each of the 12 tones comes from its own speaker. It also is, was about how Eisler was displaced and separated. Uh, and so your experience of the sound was every tone is separated, so it drew you through the space. So there was, so it was three themes of movement, separation and displacement. And that is also in the physical making of the work part of one score. So yeah, so the next work that I thought we, I could, we could show you um, is a work that I did, oh yeah, War Damaged Musical Instruments. And that's, that's a work, I know it's ongoing. And I first came across these um, broken instruments in a vitrine in here in Berlin and in the, in the Musical Instrument Museum. And I was really like, I mean, they were so badly damaged, there's no way they could have ever played music. But I, I started to think, oh, what, what kind of sound could they produce if you were to um, try and blow through it? Would, would they create, create any sound? So uh, I became obsessed with this idea and I <clears throat> went on a journey to find other musical instruments, uh, not only in Berlin, but um, in, in different musical instruments all around Germany and, and then in the UK. So in, in the end, I had collected like um, 14 different recordings from uh, these instruments that had been badly damaged in various wars. And um, but it, may, it meant that I had to go to the archives where they were stored. So they weren't um, easily accessible or it was very difficult to find them. Not many people kept damaged instruments, but I, but I did find some great ones. Like in, there was one um, from the, uh, the Charge of the Light Brigade. Um, it was a balaclava bugle. And that was, there was a whole story behind that one. Billy Britton was, was um, he fell, uh, he was, he was um, sounding the charge and he fell and a Cossack came and lanced his, his uh, bugle and there's a big gash in the, in the, in the, uh, the mouth of the, or, or the horn. And so he's, he's nursed by Florence Nightingale and then, but he dies. But anyway, the story lives on because, and, and, um, and it was wonderful that I just they were they just let me play, you know record it. There was another one from the Battle of Waterloo, and there was another one with a bullet hole through it. And again, mostly signal horns because they were used a lot on the battlefield. Um, so so I recorded again. I separated the tones of a familiar tune. This time it was a a, a signal call because. On the battlefield, you there would be different um, tunes to indicate different things. You know, so um, a signal horn would there be a, a um, something to say indicate retreat or advance or it's safe to come back. And I suppose the most famous one that we're all familiar with is this. Um, it's called taps, and um, and so. It's often played in military funerals and um, ceremonies uh, at the close of day. And so I, <clears throat> I worked with that one. There's only four tones. So I, I had each of um, the, I had the musicians play each of the four tones and then had these tones come through these horn speakers that were suspended in the Devine Gallery in Tate Britain. So I thought I could just show you a little clip. Well, actually, it's uh, I think five minutes long, but it's it starts with the Toys' Temple in in Vienna, where it's just a, a twin horns uh, that were from um, the Archduke Ferdinand's um, 
uh, oh, they were his uh, from his um, arsenal. And uh, and then so that that's in this beautiful Toys' temple, and then it moves into the the Tate Britain where I use, I have the biggest um, uh, constellation of the horns, the presentation of of the war damaged musical instruments, and that was at the Devine galleries. So yeah, maybe we could have a look at that.
Yeah. So it was great to get to work in the Devine galleries. I mean, it has this incredible acoustic. And so, I mean, I suppose that's something that a lot of all of these works have in common is that I'm working with the acoustics. And I, so the next work, the, the work, um, I See a Darkness is, that's the, working with the most extreme acoustics of all. But, you know, it was interesting because they, I see a darkness and um, the work I'd like to talk about next is a work that the, the Tate had acquired and proposed it for the Devine galleries, but it was completely inappropriate. It wasn't the right space for, for that work. It needed to be a dark space. And so, um, so in the end, um, I, I made war damaged musical instruments, which was perfect for that space because it worked with the length and one, one horn could call to the other from one side to the other. And, and um, and so so I felt that worked for, that worked well in that space. But I see a darkness. You would have to dark black black out. So then later, so some ten years later, the Tate proposed uh, the tanks in Tate Modern, and that was a perfect space for I see a darkness, uh, and it gave the, the work a whole new lease of life because I could create a whispering gallery with the the work there's a part of the work which is a call and response and you know these kind of spaces that are, are circular um, can create this kind of strange acoustical phenomenon that the sound seems to travel around or up over the 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 ceiling like in um or 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 in um, saint paul's cathedral uh, the sound seems to travel around the wall and so the acoustic becomes really, the sound becomes really intimate in the space, even though it has this very long reverberation time. So that is that is something I did with that work, I See a Darkness. And um, so I was really excited by, you know, that discovery. Um, so I See a Darkness, I mean, actually, I've only ever been to Zurich once, and I... I went to the cemetery because I've been really inspired by uh, James Joyce in earlier works, and so I wanted to visit visit where the place where he was he he, he was buried. But I was really surprised that um, he, the only member of his family that isn't there is his daughter uh, Lucia Joyce. <clears throat> so I found that really strange, and then uh, but I just later discovered that she was buried in a place in, in Northampton in England. And so I, I did some research about her and, and, um, and I, it was very sad. She, she was, I mean, so the work that I made, I See a Darkness was inspired by Lucia Joyce and Santa Lucia. And Santa Lucia was the patron saint of blindness and light. And she, um, and, and Lucia Joyce was the daughter of James Joyce, who was a very promising dancer. And she, but she uh, was a, a burning light that faded into uh, obscurity. And in the end was um, alone and in, in Northampton and, went and, and spent the rest of her days in this uh, psychiatric hospital and she's buried there. So, so it's a very sad story. Um, so yeah, so the so the part you're going to hear is just one part of the a much bigger um, in, in three part installation. But the, the part I wanted to show you is the, where there's a call and response, and it's almost like I'm channeling the voice of of Lucia Joyce through this um, um, song by uh, Will Oldham or A.K.A. Bonnie Prince Billy. And I mean, he gave me his permission to work with it and everything. So uh, he almost came to the opening, but you couldn't because he, he was ha having a baby. <laughs> so um, so that was so that was that was wonderful to get to work with that his incredible song. And um, so yeah, so uh, maybe if we ha we can we can listen to that, and I'll, I'll see a few more words. That's what you told me What's inside of me Did you ever 
Dreadful imposition comes blocking in my mind. And then I see darkness. And then I see darkness. And then I see darkness. And then I see. Well, I hope that someday soon we'll have peace in our lives together on our own all the time. And we can stop our hoping and pull the smiles inside and let it all run My best of So you heard this incredible echo it had. So that brings me to the last work that I want to talk about, which is my new work that I uh, Slow Fresh found. I just opened the show a few days ago here in Berlin in the Conrad Fisher Gallery. And one of the first things about that space is its incredible acoustics, its echo. And it has three floors and you know, it, it was hard, they're not, it's hard to keep the floors um, separate from one another. So in a similar way that I worked with the Kunsthaus Bregenz, you know, where I use the entire space. So, I mean, one of the first things I do when I enter a space is to um, project my voice out into the space to, to sort of test its acoustics. And so that's what I did in this case. But that really made me think about echo. Echo has been a part of the, a theme for the show. And, and so it brought me to the mythological echo. She, she was um, a, a, in Greek mythology, um, a mountain nymph who was cursed to repeat the last phrase or word that anyone spoke to her be because Zeus's wife um, was, she prevented Zeus, or she was like a, a decoy, so that Zeus could go and have a fling with one of the other nymphs. So Zeus's wife found out and cursed her to only repeat the last word. And so poor Echo, she was, um, she couldn't express her love for a narcissist who, who was, um, as you all know, fell in love with himself. He wasn't interested in anybody else, only his own reflection. And, and so uh, when he dies, uh, she pines away and, and all that's left of her is her voice, her, her disembodied voice in the mountains, uh, being a mountain nymph. And that's, so that was, that's where actually the word echo comes from, from her. And so, so I'm, I'm, as you've seen, I'm really interested in the, 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 the echo that the architecture produces, but also 
I've become more recently interested in objects that produce echo. And, um, you know, I've from, from water wells in Italy to the silos in Brandenburg, you know, so these are, and these oil drums that I showed more, more recently in, in LA at the Tanya Banacta Gallery. So, so the work is exploring the echo of the space and of these objects. And, and so thinking about echo, the mythological echo, I discovered this amazing poem by Ben Johnston about Echo, lamenting the death of Narcissus. And she's weeping by the fountain. And she's, she says, slow, fresh fount, keep time with my salt tears. And it's a, it's a very musical um, poem. And you can understand why composers were inspired to put it to music. And so there was one in particular, Horsley, William Horsley. And he wrote this amazing four part magical. So, so what I've done is record in my own voice all four parts of this madrigal. And a madrigal is like um, um, like a fugue or a, it has counterpoints and interweaves and it's, uh, but all comes together in unison at a certain point uh, in this particular madrigal, all the voices are, are um, come together in unison. And that's the point where both floors come together. So you hear, from the oil drums and the, the acoustics of the oil drums. Again, I was inspired by the acoustics of the, the tanks because in a way these oil drums are a little like many versions of this, this tank, which was a giant oil drum, but, and, but it still like creates the same effect with the acoustics. And so you can take this really tiny sound and put it on the speaker on top and it amplifies it incredibly. So, so that's been something that I've been working with for a while. Um, so then working with each of the four um, voices of the magical, but but not, but I've recorded them all um, the parts separately. So that to and and then I've redacted a lot of the a bit like in part file score where I've taken a lot of it away or in study for strings. I've I've I wanted to create more space to create more space for the echo. Because the magical itself is very full, you know. So I so so I recorded it in in parts, even sometimes just individual tones, to more suggest like I, you know, pro, I, I like I'm projecting my voice out into the space. So so from a distance, it, all, it sounds sounds nice, but then when you're up close, you can hear that it's actually quite raw, and um, uh, and that it's been separated. The tones are separated, and then. So you so these oil drums you will see, and then you go upstairs to these silos that I had specially made, three silos, and the sound is a lot more abstract, and but still working with the same tones from the madrigal, and but it's like a, an echo of what you you heard from downstairs, but in a much more sim simple, abstract uh, way. So maybe we'll finish we'll finish on on that film. Um, of the work in Conrad Fisher, uh, Slow Fresh Fount.
Oh, so that's it. <laughs> Well, that was the last work, and that's what I wanted to finish on. It was really, it was very recent. It only opened during gallery gallery weekend here, um, on at the weekend, <laughs> and uh, even though it was very strange with this uh, negative test and appointment only, it was still a nice. It was still nice, nice to get people to be out. And uh, that it could go ahead because it was really up until the last moment we didn't know if we were we were allowed to open. So um, it was it was really great. You know, you could really feel that people were happy, happy out. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for giving us this rich insight um, and interweaving all kinds of contexts, contents, and even technical details. Um, so I think that many of the questions we could probably come up with or have you <laughs> already uh, brilliantly answered, but I would still encourage the audience to uh, type their um, questions into the chat. We've already uh, had some spontaneous uh, exclamations and outbursts of enthusiasm <laughs> while uh, watching and listening, which brings me to a rather technical question while we wait for uh, the students and the audience to um, engage in the discussion. Um, so in a way, the documentation, the video footage uh, you've presented during this talk, um, was really providing a sense of uh, the spatial feelings and at times even um, resulting in a goosebump effect. And I've been wondering, because of course they have been very professionally done, sometimes also commissioned, I guess, by uh, those huge institutions like Tate in London, but how much are you uh, kind of scripting this video documentation or intervening or having a discussion about how your works should be filmed as being audio and works that also uh, function a lot with bodily presence uh, that is not easily transmittable through video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I'm, I'm working, I'm getting much better at it now. In fact, the reason that is because is I'm working with Robin, who's brilliant, and he's done a lot of my documentation and he knows what I, I want. I, you know, like Robin, I, I'll say, please um, also focus in on the, the voice that you can hear that it is just, uh, it's, it's uh, not always, it's not sung beautifully, you know, so from a distance, it, you know, when it, when it echoes in the space, it, you know, I wanted him to focus in on the, the, the individual tones. And he also did that in Hamburger Bahnhof when, um, because the acoustics of this space, you know, it depends on where you're standing. You can hear it all as one composition or you, as you get closer to each of the individual speakers, you understand that they're recorded separately. So, and you really, feel the physicality of the, of the bow across the string or the, even the breath of the musician. And, and that, for me, that's all really important, you know, so, but it's hard to get a sense of that from, from documentation unless you, you, you do it right, you know. And like, I, I didn't have Robin for my show in Bonn. I had two shows open this, one day after the next. One was in, in Bonn and it was commissioned by the, the the museum in, in Bonn for this swimming baths the Victoria swimming baths and it was it, I was really happy with that except we couldn't we had to just do a virtual opening it wasn't like in Berlin it was a, a pity um, but the documentation I wasn't in charge of it and the um, the sound was put on afterwards. It wasn't the actual sound of the space. You could really hear that. Mm. And for me, it was really, it's really important to get the sound, the sound sounding right, right? So, um, 
so yeah so that was that was disappointing i mean they did some really good shots of the the installation and this wonderful pool uh, the whole building i used got to use the whole building but you really didn't you, d you didn't manage to capture the sound properly so we have to go back with robin and do that again yeah and it's, it is I, I i i'm learning now that it is really important to get it documented properly you know and you can now i mean you, you know i understand that now i used to just think well you, it, it's so experiential you can't the sound is immersive you can't really recreate that in, in, a, in a video but then now it's you know you, there's a lot more you can do now than when i first showed filter for instance yeah and maybe on a similar level um i was asking myself probably it just bespeaks my um yeah, a level of uh, being removed as an art historian, not, not being a hands on a practitioner in the arts. Uh, but how are you developing the sound in your studio for those uh, large scale environments that should become immersive environments, site specific immersive environments? I mean, you've talked about your research, but on a very technical level, uh, how can you test uh, <laughs> the effect uh, beforehand in your studio? Yeah, it's 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 like another good question because obviously I don't have a, a space the size of Conrad Fisher Gallery or a, a train station that I can just play play around with. But um, so a lot of it you just have to imagine and hope that it would um, work. But it's interesting what happens when you bring it out into the public domain because you know like to go back again to talk about study for strings the documentary work there wasn't really any we did a we did a short test um but the, we couldn't really test it the way it would sound um until just days before the for the before the opening and the i think what happened was when i put it outside and it interacted with the sounds of the train station you know, it, it did add something to it, but I also lost something, you know, lost the intimacy. And so you could get, you know, those subtle, subtle the subtleties of the breath or the, you know, the, the bow across the strings. And, 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 and when it was scattered out across this vast space, um, you know, you, you, didn't, you didn't have that same um, feeling that as I had when I had it um, when I first produced it in the studio, it was more intimate. So it was, it was nice to get that back when I showed it in, like I showed it in MoMA and, and it was in a sort of soundproofed room and, you know, you really got a sense that it, all the tones were separated and um, yeah, so, but of course the train station it was what inspired the work, you know, this, this incredible um, vista, but the separation and the distance that you experience when you're out at the end of the platform and you're looking out into the hills and the idea came to me that the sound would come from a distance. And so that's, so yeah, so I had to just imagine that, um, that it would work, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, <laughs> we have in the meantime a question by Eronia Svaneborg, and I'm just reading it out loud. Thank you so much for this interesting insight to your work in process. You often work with your voice in your installations. I was wondering if it is important to you that the voice is your own, and could you share thoughts on how it influences the works that you are? How uh, the fact that you're not a trained singer influences your works yeah that's a good question thank you i i think um everyone can identify with a human voice uh especially when it's unaccompanied you know we all have a voice and so when i use my voice like for instance through the public address system of the bus station it's clearly not, a, you're used to hearing these um, mediated, you know, mediated voices are um, produced, uh, polished post-production or things are added, reverb is added or, you know, to make it sound nice. So I want to keep it as dry as I possibly can so you can identify with it more, you know. And so 
when you strip it back just to the I want the human aspect to be evident in the recording so if it was a very polished um, performance with all the harmonies working perfectly then I would you would lose some of that human aspect to the voice which I think is important and it's something that is in all of my works whether I work with my own voice or I work with other musicians you know so I don't so I I, I like when you hear you get a sense of their presence in the recording mm -hmm. Um, I just stumbled upon the fact when um, seeing through your bit longer CV uh, preparing for this talk that you um, have a bachelor degree in sculpture or that you started out with a um, uh, genre, if you will, of sculpture. Uh, so can you say a few words? I mean, maybe for you, it's uh, ages ago and <laughs> you're so over it. Ages ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Long time ago, I was an art, uh, a student in art school. But yeah, I, I trained as a sculptor. It's true. I did. I, I did learn to art quilt and cast and all, all the sort of traditional techniques. I, I learned all that. But for me, it was I became really interested in working in public space and 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 thinking about context, you know. So, um, but then I started working with sound um, when I started doing my masters, and I started slowly integrating sound into my installations. And at that time, I was I, I sort of became interested again about the acoustics of the space, but also, you know, what happens when you project your voice out into the space and how it can define the architecture. But also I became aware of my inner body space and, and I started and I felt that that was almost like a sculptural experience to project your voice um, out, into, out into space. And, and so that's, that's so sort of was like slowly, it seemed like a natural um, transition to go from working with um, sculptural installations to working with um, sound um, in a kind of architectural way, how it can define the architecture. Um, but it was really when I was in Belfast that I started really thinking about exploring these these um, public spaces. Uh, you know, th th there was so much uh, there at the time, you know, to fire your imagination, you know, I could imagine, you know, we had all, all sorts of projects, so there was actually no spaces to exhibit in, there was no galleries, <laughs> so we had to sort of, you know, um, so I thought, well, why not show here, you know, this is wonderful, and where you had to really consider the context, and the, why would it create meaning for the work to be in this particular place, and so, and sound was a very good medium um, for me to do that, but it really was the, it was, I suppose it came hand in hand with sound and public space, you know, like in the bus station. Mm -hmm. or, yeah. And another thing, um, I got aware probably even more through the documentation uh, we've looked at together is that you're very well introducing also visual elements or even the choice of uh, speakers or echo cha chambers uh, you choose uh, is very conscious. Um, so maybe you could also say a few words about this um, visual layer. On the one hand, in the Hamburger Bahnhof installation, it surely allowed also to tell a story. Um, about this composer and his uh, prosecution in the US, but um, how do you balance these elements and when do you deem it necessary and when is uh, something on the wall less important than picking the right uh, speaker? Mm -hmm. Well, if in that case, the speakers really disappeared into those archways. So I, I chose those very long, speakers that are directional, the kind of speakers that you might find in church, which has a very um, extreme acoustic, you know, and they're especially made for that. I mean, the Hamburger Bahnhof has very um, challenging acoustics. Uh, but I felt that these the FBI, I, I, think, I think I might have forgotten to mention those, but uh, during the time Eisler was in, um, 
LA, he, the FBI compiled a file on him. It was, it was 566 pages long and followed his every move, but it's a really fascinating document because it really um, shows uh, who he was friends with. I mean, he was friends with Adorno and Schoenberg and Chaplin and all these people are, but, the, but it's redacted, you know, so, so it became declassified information, but then, and, but it was, it's, as you saw, heavily redacted. So I thought it'd be interesting to superimpose those F, redacted FBI files onto Eisler's scores that I worked with. So, uh, because Eisler himself, you can see he has redacted some of it, but, but with his own hand and he's got his handwriting. And then you've got the, um, so it's, it's uh, for Eisler scholars, it's a really interesting document and it does kind of um, chart his journey from his, the beginning when he first arrived and to when he was um, forced to leave and go back to Germany. So, um, yeah, I thought they added something to, to, the, to the work. Um, but, you know, the speakers, I mean, and of course, more the, the show that I have now and that uh, Conrad Fisher, these objects that, that um, are, 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 are resonate acoustically um, is something that, that I've been working with for a long time, well, not a long time, but, you know, more recently, I suppose, um, in the last two years. Uh, and working with these water wells and, 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 and spaces that resonate. Um, yeah, so, so the object is very present in that, that exhibition. But I wanted just to work with objects that are every day like they're, they're, the, the, the silo is something we're familiar with and the oil drum is something familiar with and it's an industrial looking object. But I, I thought, you know, when you think about Echo, the, the mythological Echo, she was in the mountain tops. But, you know, I think she's, she can also be found in these objects, these sort of everyday objects, you know. <laughs> okay. um, so, I mean, I guess there's plenty to know about your work still and to discover. Uh, but uh, our audience remains silent. Uh, but as we know also from your work, this kind of absence uh, <laughs> or <laughs> supposed absence is only a marker of presence. <laughs> uh, and uh, I also think you really um, precisely uh, outlined your practice and what is important uh, in crafting and displaying your work. Um, so I would say, let's call it an art talk. Thank you so much, Susan Phillips. It was an honor. Uh, I see people clapping also. <laughs> the <Aww. scene. laughs> well, it was an honor for me to be part of such a great um, art talk, Rostrum, Annika Strom. She's a dear friend of mine and I, I'll be tuning into that one. So see you, some of you again then. But lovely to see you all. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for offering your time. And we are also looking forward to see you all again uh, on occasion of Annika Strom's art talk on 19th of May, which is kind of soon, in about two weeks. So please tune in again. And tonight, have a lovely evening. Bye bye. <laughs>